Good evening, good evening everyone. I, uh, you know, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. I also have to apologize that I didn't prepare a PowerPoint. Uh, I usually don't like PowerPoints anyway. PowerPoint, I guess my PowerPoint is a big problem the way that we teach now. Um, but anyway, uh, what I, I was hoping, I was actually thinking about showing some uh, videos and so on, but I figured uh, we'll, uh, I have to sort of download big files. And I don't know about the screen anymore. So, we might as well to uh, go go without it. So I have about twenty minutes to talk about uh, to talk about reform and openness uh, in the shadow of danger. So I guess where my talk might be slightly different from you know the, the others is I will be actually not focusing so much on Singapore. I'll be talking a little bit about I'll be talking a little bit more about Taiwan and slightly a little less on South Korea. Um, the idea is to give you a picture of other societies that also face uh, existential uh, dangers, how they try to deal with these issues while incorporating uh, greater uh, social and political participation. Right. So uh, that's that's the sort of general uh, thrust of where I'll be going. Now, where I'd like to start uh, today is 1987. Now, 1987 is a big year uh, in uh, across Asia. Um, of course, many of you will know that you know 1987 means uh, something here in Singapore, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about. In 1987, um, in in July of 1987, what happened in Taiwan? July, um, let me check my notes here. July 15, actually, 1987, Taiwan declared the end of martial law. Now, this is the end of the so-called period of white terror, where we had, where we saw um, uh, a lot of detention without trial, we saw a lot of uh, regime opponents getting locked up, getting disappeared, um, and the martial law period had actually began in, um, in, in 1947, uh, with the, uh, in the aftermath of the 228 uh, massacre in, in Taiwan. So, it's this, you know, um, this sort of very long, several decades um, of um, very pretty heavy-handed authoritarian rule that ended in 1987 and so on. Uh, of course, this it, it wasn't something that happened in isolation. In 1986, um, we saw we saw the lifting of the ban of the long-time ban on the formation of new political parties in Taiwan. In early 1988, this is January 1988, uh, Jiang Jingguo, the uh, the, the, the president of, of Taiwan uh, passes away, uh, and he and taking over him is uh, Li Donghui, and and with that, with uh, Zhao Ningguo's death, actually uh, with, both within the Taiwan's ruling party at that time, the Kuomintang or the National Chinese Nationalist Party, um, and also in the state more generally, uh, there was a lot more contestation, um, a lot of the pressures and. Um, Suppress debates about where Taiwan ought to go, where Taiwan uh, ought to be politically, socially, started coming about. Uh, this, of course, gets us to uh, pressure for direct presidential elections. The the um, and and the and and the uh, uh, this push to get rid of what was called the National Assembly. It was uh, an assembly that had uh, that basically supposed is supposed to represent. All of China, because as many of you know, um, the KMT government had relocated from China, and with it, it brought um, people elected both in the um, legislative unit at that time, the lower house, and also the national assembly, then the upper house from China. So you had, you know, people, people who are getting on in, the, in, in in age, but representing places like Hunan in China, where you know, so it's a bit um, archaic. So they, uh, there's a push to get rid of that. There's a push to move towards direct presidential elections in 1990. Um, and you know this then moves to of course the the Taiwan's democratization, which I can talk a little bit more about. So you can what I'm trying to paint for you here is this progression, right? Um, things are also changing at the same time in South Korea. Um, again, if we look at the year 1987, uh, what we saw in June, there's uh, what was called the June uh, Democracy Movement. Um, basically, what had happened was um, that. South Korea had a succession of uh, military rulers, and in what happened in, uh, earlier in June was that uh, Chen Zhuhuan, the at that time the, the president, 
he appointed um, a, a, a person by the name of Nong Tehu to take over, uh, and so there was no sort of um, there's no sort of direct representation. It was an appointment, right? It was a succession by appointment, and this led to a lot of demonstrations uh, that went on for about two weeks in June. It then rolled over into a, a major uh, uh, industrial action in July 1987, and this of course pushes. Uh, you know, creates pressure um, for the uh, South Korean government at that point in time. Now, what happened? About, what ha what happened was uh, South Korea had won the right to um, host the Olympics in 1988. So the South Korean government, the military government, thought you know it would be really bad form to say the least to start repressing or you know killing people right before the Olympics. So what they end up doing is acquiescing to these social pressures. And so in December 1987, what we see is a direct presidential election in, um, in South Korea. What happens actually is the originally sort of a designated uh, successor, Nogi who actually wins, right, um, and, and becomes the president. But this does sort of lead to an opening up of more, uh, more sort of directly Contest, uh, contested partisan politics, right? So it's not just sort of uh, labor politics. It's not just street politics anymore. Um, and why, you know, are these two examples notable? Um, you know, along with uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, most of you will know that uh, Taiwan and South Korea were among the uh, four Asian tigers, right? So you know, these are. Uh, at least in, in uh, Asian terms, in, in, in Asia, pretty advanced uh, industrial societies. Um, the, um, the, GDP, the per capita GDP was pretty high. They, it was both were around about um, you know, three, four thousand uh, US dollars at that point in time. So you know, um, and, and that would put them at the sort of um, uh, middle, at that point in time, like the sort of higher middle income uh, category of states. Um, and what is also of note um, for both Taiwan and South Korea is that both of them face tremendous um, external existential threats uh, externally and to some degree um, uh, internal divisions as well. Um, in the case of Taiwan, um, you know, since the end of the uh, Chinese Civil War in 1949, what we had was um, the KMT relocating the government uh, from the mainland to Taiwan, uh, the Chinese communists running the Chinese uh, uh, running to the Chinese mainland. But um, because of the Korean War, what happened was the uh, the U.S. decided that it needed to sort of keep Taiwan as um, as uh, anti-communist, as non-communist. So the Seventh Fleet effectively helped separate um, China from Taiwan. And this allowed for Taiwan's uh, continued existence. However, the Chinese communists have never, and even to today, have never given up uh, the, uh, the, the view that they ought to be unifying with Taiwan. And the Chinese communists also reserve the right to use force to unify if necessary, right? So there's this, um, there's this sort of existential uh, threat to the, the state that gets established on, on Taiwan. And I mean, if you, those of you who um, who have been sort of keeping track of what's been happening in Taiwan of late? Um, yes, you know there has been a lot. There has been a lot more economic exchange. But um, one of the, the concerns that this has brought in the case of Taiwan is that uh, the uh, that the, that China has been using uh, its its, uh, its wealth to sort of buy up influence in Taiwan. This is what led to the sunflower movement um, that some of you may be familiar with uh, that happened last March, actually about a year ago. Uh, a lot of that was out of concern that, uh, well, part of it, there were a lot of governance issues, but part of it also had to do with uh, fears uh, about China. Now, uh, in, the, in, the case of, uh, in the case of South Korea, they too um, had a big existential threat, right? Um, there's North Korea sitting uh, on the border right next to them. Uh, today, we know of North Korea as uh, a nuclear armed state. It has you know, uh, a million person uh, armed forces. The, uh, the, the so-called the, the, the militarized zone that separates North from South Korea is about 35 miles or 56 kilometers from Seoul, which means to say that Seoul is in artillery range from the DMZ, and most of uh, most of uh, South Korea's population, uh, most of its industrial base is centered in the area around Seoul. So, in that respect, uh, South Korea too faces 
um, face then and continues to face um, a uh, major existential threat. So, um, you know, apart from these sort of issues, if you think about um, resources and other kinds of endowments, um, Taiwan and South Korea too, uh, you know, are in somewhat precarious positions. Neither have very much in the way of their own natural resources. Both are fairly um, both trade and external trade. Seaborne trade is, is uh, important to both of them. Both import a lot of energy. Um, in fact, most of the, in fact, all of the, I think all of the gas and oil is uh, is imported. Yes, they, they do have nuclear power, but uh, you know it's still this that these are areas of vulnerability still exist. So this I think raises a question uh, for us. It creates a puzzle, right? So if in face of all these external pressures, these external threats, um, you know why is it that you have these societies that decide collectively, right, there is of course a lot of contestation, but ultimately the decision is to open up. The decision is to allow for more political contestation. And you know, it's not and it's not just the sort of external uh, problem that's out there. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, um, there are inter uh, internal divisions that can be quite serious as well. So those of you who know Taiwan a little bit um, will also know that about 15% of the Taiwan population uh, comes uh, is of so-called mainland origin, meaning to say that these were uh, people uh, who are or were dis are descended from um, folks who came with KMT from the mainland. Now, why is this an issue? This uh, fifty percent or so-called mainland is it's an issue because um, they came over, you know, together with the KMT, and a lot of them served the KMT state. Um, this, in, in, of course, included uh, civil servants. It also included uh, police. It also included military personnel. So there's an impression that uh, there's this group of people who's, uh, who are associated with uh, authoritarian rule. Of course, many of um, many of the sort of mainlanders were not as well, and there were many during the white period of white terror. A lot were uh, many were arrested uh, for opposing the, the regime. But the point is, there is this sort of group that is seen as somehow different. And within Taiwan society as well, there's been traditional cleavages between the Hakka and the Hokkien or the, or the Hokkien speaking uh, group. And within the Hokkien speaking group, you also have the uh, people who came from uh, Sangzhou uh, and also the, another group that came from Quanzhou. And traditionally, they were, you know, um, they were, uh, you know, fighting over over land. And in addition to, to these groups, um, one of the things that also happened in sort of um, Taiwan's history was that the Aboriginal groups were um, much of when, when the people came over from, from the mainland, the Aboriginal groups were sort of pushed up into the mountains, their land was taken. So there's a lot of social contestation. There's all this sort of nascent tension that's going on. Uh, for sort of many of us who visit Taiwan, you just you know go to Taipei, you go to the night markets, you, you miss out on some of these uh, social tensions that actually do exist. So um, it's not it's not put on display all the time, but if, if you actually listen to some of the election rhetoric, it's that much better now. But you listen to some older election rhetoric, it does it does come out. You get, um, for instance, um, some of the sort of anti-KMT stuff uh, very easily becomes anti-mainlander. So you have um, you you have people calling mainlanders to you know get out of Taiwan to, to go back to the mainland. Um, you have uh, mainlanders being referred to as Washington uh, which is uh, mainlander pig, right? So there, there are these sort of issues that are there. So, um, but yet in the face of these sort of domestic pressures as well. Uh, Taiwan decided, well, one of the things they still had to do, uh, Taiwan meaning the people of Taiwan, decided they had to sort of get on with opening up the society. The question, again, is why was this the case? Well, um, you know, for, for many of us who are from Singapore, the one of, and this, is, this gets to the whole myth part, right? The sort of overriding um, sort of line of thinking that we have is, Okay, so if there are external threats, if there are internal divisions, what we need is more control, not less. What we need is to sort of uh, you know, put, put aside our differences, not talk about our differences, and that is seen as almost necessarily the way forward. Uh, but in slightly different, slightly different circumstances, uh, there diff it's possible to come up with different conclusions. Uh, these conclusions include, for instance, well, if there are differences, um, it's not just a matter of you know uh, the majority overcoming the minority. It's also an issue of well, if there are minorities, um, you know what, what sorts of rights should we accord them? If there are people who are marginalized, 
Uh, what sorts of positions do they have? Of course, the place to start um, when looking at Taiwan, obviously, is, the, uh, is between the sort of different um, sort of sub-ethnic groups that I talked about. But um, if you sort of think about these differences more broadly, then you know you you think you know you could be you could be sort of on a, mi a minority on or you could be a majority on one particular issue. For instance, if you're if you're Hokkien or Hokkien speaking, you could be the major uh, in the majority. But what happens if you know you you happen to um, you, you happen to be in um, you happen to be you know in a mi uh, on the minority on some sort of political issue that you're voting on? Um, you know if what what rights do you have if, for instance, you you think that um, one of the sort of um, I guess very sort of clear examples is what happens if you are one of those who uh, who are very sort of strident uh, pro independence in Taiwan? Um, you know what what should what should what you do? Should you have um, should you have some kind of position to uh, be able to express yourself? Should you sort of figure well, there's no no space for me in this society, and therefore I will uh, try to look somewhere else. Uh, these are the sorts of things that get debated. I mean, it, it cuts across many issues on uh, things like healthcare. Taiwan has a very good public healthcare system. Uh, on things like rights for um, L uh, LGBTQ, uh, the LGBTQ community. So there are lots of these kinds of issues. And the conclusion uh, that came about was that, well, um, since it's possible for anyone to be in the minority at any one point in time, then perhaps we need to work out an another system, right, to uh, to, to try to accommodate, to try to live together. And the system that they came about, of course, um, was to have more political competition. So different views could be presented, uh, dif uh, different issues could be brought out. Um, of, this, doesn't say, this doesn't mean that problems go away. In fact, um, those of you who actually do watch uh, Taiwan news programs, it seems very contentious, there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of shouting. Uh, but, I mean, what that is sort of symptomatic of some of the uh, emotive aspects of the political process. But um, what is quite remarkable is that none of this descends into violence anymore. Right? So in, in that respect, um, what, what seems to be the case is that uh, for all the messiness and the room for improvement that Taiwan's democratic system may uh, continue to, to have, you know, it, it appears that you know, this, this may be one sort of alternative conclusion that this society can come up with, rather than to say, well, just because of differences, we cannot talk about them. We have to sort of uh, hide, hide them. Now, um, the, the, other sort of, uh, the other sort of point that uh, I'd like to raise about uh, the Taiwan experience here is that there are two, well, there are two other points I'd like to make. Uh, one is that this sort of movement uh, in Taiwan's case was uh, some, you know, it had a certain, it had a sort of unique aspect, just like, you know, any other sort of political process, process of, of political change has a certain uniqueness. The fact that Taiwan was highly isolated, the fact that um, the U.S. had broken off relations and one by one, its uh, countries that formerly recognized Taiwan diplomatically ceased to do so after 1979, meant that the um, Taiwanese leadership and this this would be this would include the uh, leadership of the KMT and the Jiang Ming because they had to rebrand and remake themselves. And the way to do so was they figured, well, if you're going to tell others that you are a developed but pretty authoritarian country, you know, that doesn't seem very attractive. So the conclusion was, okay, maybe what we need to do is to allow for um, more protection of uh, civil and political rights, more protection of human rights, um, and so that you know there will there will be more a sort of of a positive buzz about the place. Right? And so there is that sort of external uh, imperative that leads to the, uh, that sort of uh, help to the greater openness on Taiwan. Um, in addition, uh, what we see in 87 wasn't handed on a platter. Um, you, really from, the, um, from you know, 1947 onward, there was a lot of domestic resistance to KMT rule, the camp and, and it was all to, uh, to and froing. Uh, but the, one of the things that the KMT did allow was uh, initially contestation for um, local uh, for local and municipal seats, and um, this allowed some room for political contestation to happen. This gave some space for people to sort of add 
uh, air their, um, uh, their, their concerns. And there were, there were constant sort of efforts to push at that envelope, including uh, you know, what at, at that time were underground radio stations, uh, at that time were um, magazines that, uh, that, were, that were banned for various kinds of reasons. Uh, but these sort of pushed at the boundaries. The, the, and that constant contestation, and uh, together with the experience of actually um, participation in the political process, uh, also created a ground-up pressure, uh, a degree of ground-up pressure that forced greater openness in the system. Um, and again, I mean, if you look at the South Korean case, there is a parallel where, um, I mean, one of, one of the images that we have, uh, endure, more enduring images we have of, um, of South Korea is that, you know, at least used to have very active labor unions, used to have uh, very active um, agricultural uh, uh, I guess I guess there were unions too, but representing agricultural workers, agricultural agricultural concerns, and these efforts to sort of um, put, uh, to sort of pursue the pursue protections, pursue the, the sort of economic rights for these groups of people, you know, did end up into things of did bleed over into issues of political rights, bleed, did bleed over into issues of political representation. So again, this sort of plot, uh, process of contestation was uh, you know built up to what we saw. Um, in 1987, uh, and, and the sort of um, uh, process uh, from there. Now, of course, you know, there's the question of, okay, so what happens uh, after political liberalization? What happens after the opening up? Uh, of course, it's not a panacea that there are always a lot of, you know, as society changes, as the economy changes, there are always sort of constant challenges to face. So, what we see then um, are these sort of constant efforts to tweak at the system. Sometimes they're greater, um, there are moments of greater crises as we saw with the Sunflower Movement. But um, what, these seem to, what these events seem to suggest though is that, that you know, they, these sort of noisy and somewhat messy events can be ways for society to self-adjust when you, when you have um, the political process some, somewhat breaking down. You, you know, the fact that you have a strong uh, civil society, you do have citizens who are um, active and accustomed to participation, there is room for self-adjustment. And so in the Taiwan case, for instance, one of the reasons why we, another reason why we saw the sunflower when I talked about, um, I talked about the uh, fear of the mainland, and that was, another was because um, there was a lot of pressure building up in the, in the way that mainland relations were handled by the Mayan Zhou government which was um, a lot of deals were basically made them push through the legislature very quickly. So it seemed to uh, many people in Taiwan at the point in time that, um, you know, yes, the administration was trying to push through whatever its agenda, but the opposition was highly ineffective as well. Um, the opposition made a lot of noise, um, but, you know, by and large, they, you know, they didn't seem to oppose hard enough, right? So um, what in, so I think this crystallized with the passing of the, what was called the cross rates. Um, service and trade agreement, um, where basically the legislative process, they tried to pass this bill that allowed for more mainland investment, uh, more mainland labor going to Taiwan. It was passed in 30 seconds. And so this was what, um, in the legislature, so this was what really agitated uh, people to, to go onto the streets to sort of seek, to say, well, look, there's something seriously wrong with the system if there's so much unrestrained executive power um, and the opposition, you know, doesn't seem to be doing its job. You have um, you have a agreement that needs to be properly, um, there needs to be proper hearings with the agreement, there needs to be a proper sort of voting process, but during the sort of hearings, uh, groups who, who, f who felt that their interests may be harmed seemed to have been kept out of the hearings, um, and then when it came to the vote, it was just you know, passed through very, very quickly. So um, then a lot of the sort of uh, civil society felt that they had to uh, uh, take things into their own hands. There, there was there was some um, violence, especially sort of state um, uh, violence by the state on, on the protesters who were large, who actually were uh, were very restrained and tried to be uh, peaceful the whole time through. But um, you know that is a, the sort of process of adjustment uh, that the system allows. It may not be very uh, pretty, it may not be very clean or tidy, but you know that that is a sort of process of, of adjustment. Um, and of course, you may ask, okay, so there are all these sort of adjustments. How about how about the economy? Um, how about the economy um, and and sort of other uh, other other issues that are out there? So if you take Taiwan's GDP, um, I, I said it was about around three four thousand uh, US dollars per capita. Um, 
1987. Now it's close to about 30,000. Right? So there is sort of room for, uh, despite the contestation, for uh, economic growth. In the case of South Korea, um, what we saw was uh, growth from also about, about uh, three four thousand uh, US dollars per capita GDP to, to today is like 27,000 or something like that. Um, it's a bit low because you have to realize that Taiwan and South Korea, they, uh, the, the, they have a larger agricultural sector, so that sort of pulls down the, uh, the per capita GDP a little bit. But um, the, the sort of just of what I'm trying to get across here then is to say that, you know, if despite the sort of um, external and domestic pressures that societies face, um, the conclusion doesn't necessarily always have to be um, that you know you put you put aside um, restraints on the executive power that you uh, that you put aside um, things like uh, uh, minority rights you you you, uh, you put aside um, issues of uh, representation and political contestation uh, and this I think is an interesting uh, pro uh, proposition to consider given um, you know given the sort of emphasis on you know, the, the need to sort of really, um, really not, uh, to think, to see a lot of these issues as secondary in, um, in, in our own context. Moreover, um, I think it's, it's also perhaps uh, use, useful to consider that uh, maybe uh, one of the things with uh, systems that are more open and allow for more contestation is that you know, it allows for you know, more over the longer period of time, more sort of peaceful and perhaps stable political change. Uh, because you know, if you are changing, pushing for change through elections and sometimes even protests, you know, that is a lot cheaper in terms of your social costs than uh, going after revolution, than having state failure. So some of the messiness um, that we see uh, in, these, in, the, in the political liberalization process um, may actually in the longer term be costs that are more acceptable than, say, state failure or something like revolution. And I just, you know, want, I guess that's, that's the sort of thought that I want to leave you guys with. And I, I guess I'm about, time am I? A little bit past it. But okay, <laughs> sorry. 